Hey, welcome to The Perspective Today. I'm Mike Sherbino. And uh, almost every program that we do has a slightly different twist. Some of the things that we talk about uh, might be things that are not on your radar screen, and maybe they are. And today, I think, is going to be one of those days when we're going to catch you uh, off guard. We're going to catch you off guard because we're going to talk about a subject that I don't think I've ever talked about on television, at least in such blunt terms. We're going to talk about conflict. You've heard about that. But in particular, I want to talk about revenge. What does that look like? And you can hear it in the sound of my voice as we think about, I'm going to get even with that person. I'm going to get back what I deserve and give him or her what they deserve. But we don't want to be known for that, do we? At least not really. We want to justify our emotions that we're feeling. And we also want to justify our responses. But many times we lash out and all sorts of damage can happen in relationships. I'm glad that I can say that I have a dear friend. I have many friends, but this is a dear friend who is on the program today. He has been used in a very significant way to bring reconciliation between governments, between people that are at odds with each other, in churches where there's been irreconcilable differences. God has used him to negotiate challenging situations. He's known as a mediator, but there's many other incredible terms that could be used to describe my friend, Dr. John Radford. And uh, John, I want to welcome you to the program. It's been a couple of years since you've been on. Thanks for coming back on. And it's so good to have you here today. Mike, thank you. Thank you for your kind words and very nice to be back with you. So thank you. Yeah, and there's so many areas, John, that you and I can jump in because uh, what I have not said at the beginning of the program is that sometimes in a conflicted situation where I've been leading an organization, I've actually invited you to come in and to work on that situation and to be a coach to me as well. And so I've experienced firsthand uh, the what I consider the unique abilities that God has given you to help uh, different groups that are at odds with each other to navigate uh, a way to health and wholeness. Uh, but let's talk about a subject that I think is a bridge to this whole s topic of revenge, which just doesn't sound good when we say it, it sounds very harsh. But when trust is broken in a relationship, what does that look like? What have you seen uh, people go through as they all of a sudden realize trust has been broken and they call out to you for help? Unpack some of those scenarios for us. So, yeah, often it is around trust, am I? Because with trust, it ties to relationship. It ties to what's important to, to now talk for myself, for me in, in, in a relationship. There's obviously an expectation. There's a purpose. There's an outcome that, about what I anticipate from the other person in a, in a relationship. And so when that trust is broken, uh, what happens is I, I'm disappointed, first of all, with the, the other person, the situation. There's also a little bit of it, but we've got to remember, I'm disappointed also in myself um, because how did I get myself into that situation? And that's not necessarily front of mind, Mike, but, uh, but, but too often I am, there's that little element of myself about that, that kind of uncomfortable feeling. Yeah. So, so yeah, trust broken does, it has that emotional component, right? I think another word that you've mentioned is there's a, a loss of credibility. And, and maybe it can be for both sides, but can you unpack that a bit for us? Yeah, because part of, the, part of credibility is who I believe I am, right, in, in a situation. So it would tie to role. It also ties to who I believe at my core. It's my, kind of my identity. And, and for the other person as well, there's an expectation about credibility, about how this would work. So when trust is broken, uh, that damage, it is, it is like a break. It is like a break in a chain, right? It, it's broken. Mm -hmm. And so that credibility in that moment um, is, is damaged. Uh, sometimes it feels like it's lost for good. It's that feeling that really is important. So uh, too often, and I see this uh, in, in Christian circles as well, we jump to 
to even forgive. Um, so I, I don't want to undersell revenge. I, I think it's an important part. It's clear, it's strong in the Bible. We see revenge in so many different ways. Um, and uh, and so revenge is important because it's we ha- to acknowledge that sense of myself that something happened. Um, and if I don't acknowledge that, then not only is it uncomfortable, but over time, uh, I might notice I am become resentful. So when I think about that person, when I think about the situation that we found ourselves in, whatever it might be, there's a resentfulness mm. about it. That resentfulness can, over time, and sometimes it can be short appearance, it depends on the situation, lead to bitterness. Um, and that's, that's what we don't want. Um, in fact, the Bible uh, is quite clear that um, that that bitterness, if it grows, um, it can it it can cause yeah it can cause problems. So it actually says I'm, I'm thinking about Hebrews twelve, Mark, where it says mm-hmm. see, see to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root causes us uh, trouble and and may defile many. So not only does it impact me, but it could impact many. One of the things I've noticed in my conflict work in, in in very difficult situations, even in war situations, it's always surprised me. And I think I've said this once before, at least in one of our conversations, Mike, about that how much of a, a situation, even a war situation, and I don't necessarily want to go there today, but is dependent on individuals, literally on individuals who are making decisions about a situation, about themselves in the situation. So I never underestimate that uh, in any situation that I work in, or even in my own life and situation. John, if I could interject for a moment, as you're talking, I'm listening, I'm playing some scenarios in my mind, and that's the way our mind mm-hmm. works. But I'm thinking about the news. The news that I watched last night, I've been tracking with the last few days, uh, there are some high profile legal cases going on, and they're happening in the States. There's also happening here in Canada. And I'm always intrigued that when it becomes so apparent that a person is guilty, that the first thing they say is they're not guilty. (laughs) And and as you work with people, maybe it's in a marriage relationship. I know you've done that. But also one of the things that intrigues me is many times you work with family businesses where, Mm. you know, money has become the dividing issue or someone has died and they're trying to clear up the estate and and I deserve more, you know, they don't deserve as much. And we always exonerate ourselves, don't we? At least most of the time. And the other person, we point that finger, the other person is guilty. Can you unpack that a little bit? And how do we get a window into our own soul? Right. And it's the most difficult thing, Mike. So you put your finger right on the key thing, right? Um, How do we do that? Because it is natural for me, for all of us, built in, because when when I'm in a conflict situation, when my expectations are not being met and and I I will naturally feel a tension within inside of me. So I call it that that inattention. Uh, there's there's a deep sense of built into us that when we have that tension, we want to get we want to release it, we want to get rid of it. And so it's it's uh, the easiest and simplest way is to say, well, it's not me, it's you. So so in those situations, often I will put the blame and we uh, we use it as blame on the other person um, that it's it's them to blame rather than my situation. So that's a very normal natural thing to occur. How do we? How do we own? How do we even recognize our part of it, Mike? And, and that is, I mean, that's a that's a that's a life challenge. I, I, I do. I want to just use a, one scriptural piece, and I forget the actual chapter, but it's the part when um, Jesus is confronted, I think, by um, the Pharisees at the well, and it is around revenge. And so these men are gathered there. A woman has committed adultery. And, and in those terms, justice in that system was you'd actually take out revenge on that person. Um, and so they were, they were about to stone this woman. And so they almost mockingly turned to Jesus and said to him, so what would you do, Jesus? <laughs> and Jesus is a great example. It, it, it actually says, so I take my, my lead from that. It actually says that in the scripture that Jesus, I'm just paraphrasing, that Jesus bent down 
to the earth and he drew something in the sand. We will never know what he drew. But what he did in that moment is so important around anything to do with conflict, but let's talk revenge. Uh, we need to pause. We just need to stop for a moment and reflect. And I believe that's what Jesus was doing in there because he was actually challenged. If they were putting him on the spot, uh, they knew what he stood for in terms of forgiveness. And that's what really he was preaching and doing that. And so he was crossing against the law and kind of the old covenant at that point and, the, and the, the, their, their way of seeing what justice and, and how this should work out. So he steps down and, and he draws on the sand. So there's he's pausing. And we, I don't know what he was thinking to himself, but we know what he did. He then stood up. And so he paused. I'm um, sure so he, he, he actually just reflected on the tension within him. He stood up. And in that moment, he was actually thinking about the context. And I think that's very important that he's in the role. Uh, he's got God with him. Uh, we have God within us in terms of Holy Spirit. He's thinking of the context. And then what he does is quite amazing. He says to those mm. men gathered there, he says, he who has sinned, throw the first stone, throw the first rock. And, and the scripture wow. then captures what's going on. Because So he turns it to say, look inward. Um, so there they are. They are seeking mm. revenge, literally there in that moment. And he says to them, he guides them to the inner to the inner journey, right? He to, to go in. So he's saying, saying to them, pause and think about wow. yourself in any situation. And then it's, it's really sense. I mean, the scripture implies that one by one, they kind of slinked away, right, from that situation. They slinked away. Exactly. It's, it's, isn't it amazing? Yeah, yeah. It is an amazing story. John, stay with us. We're going to take a short break. Folks, you're watching The Perspective, and at any time, you're welcome to call our toll-free number, 855-910-6297. We're here to pray with you, to encourage you. If you have questions, why don't you call that number right now? And we're going to be back in just a moment with Dr. John Radford. back right now with Dr. John Radford and among many other things, he's a registered mediator, which John, I think everybody wants your personal cell phone number so that they could call you at supper time to solve the problems. <laughs> uh, give us your thoughts on this whole issue of revenge and forgiveness. Um, and then I, there's another word, I don't know if we'll have time today, but reconciliation, is it all possible? Talk to us about revenge right. first and then forgiveness. Mike, yeah. So the key thing to remember about all of this is that we have choice. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that God has given us choice in, in all these situations. So with revenge, I'm choosing, think about it, I'm choosing by not letting you go or not letting that thought, letting it dwell within me to ruminate on it myself. Uh, by doing that, I'm actually holding you to my journey. I'm giving you agency over my life. Now, if you think about that, if you stop and think about that just for a second, that, that's, that's a crazy thing to do. We are doing it because we feel underneath the anger, underneath the pain, mm. is a sense of injustice. So we feel that if we can get something from you, then, then, then there's, some, there's some sort of justice in that. Uh, and the justice system is designed around that. So it is a form, if you want, at one level, it's a form of, of equalizing the justice in the system. But so interesting that often even in the justice system where people would go through a process of receiving justice, they can still have that, that struggle in their, in their hearts and in what they're doing. So part of revenge is making a choice about whether I will hold on to that thought, that idea, that pain, or I will release it. Um, there are some situations where releasing it is problematic, and I, I'm not going to go into that in detail, Mark, but those are the kind of situations where there's abuse, right? Th those, are, those are specific situations where it does need to be taken to another level of not releasing but holding someone directly accountable for a situation. So there's a power imbalance, and it's, it's either yeah, some sort of abuse situation often tied to, to role, age, um, 
uh, and, and whatever that circumstance might be. Mm. But outside of that, we actually have a choice um, as to what we do. And the choice is called forgiveness, right? Um, uh, one of the reasons why revenge is important, I know we focus on revenge because often we go straight to forgiveness. Mike, one of the reasons why it's important is, is simply that um, we can, I call leapfrog over uh, the pain and the problem to revenge. And, and too often I see that, right? I mean, the extreme point, way of leapfrog over, I actually saw one again this week. I actually come across it really often actually in my work where people take, take this as an extreme form of forgiveness that's actually an offense. People uh, will send someone else an email out of the blue saying, I forgive you for the following list, one, two, three, four. Now, think about that. That is that is actually not true forgiveness because we haven't actually dealt with the issue that's between you and the other person. So revenge in self is a choice, but underlying the pain, it's important to talk about the impact of the situation, the behavior. So to understand that's important. So a sharing, and that's the that's getting to the truth. Now there's there's God's truth, and then we all have our own individual truths of a situation. Mm-hmm. But so part of, of forgiveness is not jumping over the pain and, and that hurts. Okay. So if, yeah. as I think about that, <clears throat> you know, there's there's so many different components uh, weighing hmm. in on this. And in the back of my mind, there is uh, the word reconciliation. Does hmm. reconciliation always happen? And is it necessary to happen? Right. So I'm so often asked my questions around that, that, um, you know, if I choose to forgive, will there be reconciliation? No, there's no guarantee. And here's why. And also, do I need the other person to repent, uh, to apologize? And before I forgive, no, um, they are, they are separate, but the result can be reconciliation. So let me unpack it just for a moment. So my choice to forgive is very much a personal choice. Uh, at the end of the day, it's what I choose or together if I'm together with someone else or if I'm together in a community, it's what we choose to do is actually that so, so forgiveness is a choice in that way. Just like someone apologizing or repenting is also a choice. Um, to choose to do that, right? To, um, and so the, if there is forgiveness and on the, as it were, the other side, someone is uh, repenting or apologizing and there's an earnest, there's a, a real earnestness to that, then you have the chance of reconciliation. Um, and reconciliation is parties are coming to a new place. But let me just say one other piece. Too often, what happens is, so let's say we hear through the broken trust or what's happened, I get to a lower point. Then at this point, we reconcile. So there's forgiveness and repentance. We are not back where we were, where we started. We are not. We are still down here in terms of relationship. We're at this lower point. And that's so important to remember, particularly people when we have... um, you know, when we have apologized, we've made some, and then we assume, no, it's all okay. No, it's not okay. It's down here. We need to build, rebuild that that trust, that, that bridge between us, one little piece at a time, one word, one action. Uh, and, and often it's a more difficult journey because it's been broken, so we're rebuilding. So, so when we're down here, reconciliation does not equal it's all sorted out. No, we're at a point where we can begin the journey to rebuild. And that journey ideally should be the offender. If I'm the offender, I am responsible for starting but we need to do it together. It's not wow. a single thing. That's that's your bridge. John, it's an amazing uh, process as you're laying it out and we can't help to, to cover the whole thing, but I'm gonna ask you to come back next week and we're gonna take it a little further, something to look forward to as we consider how to resolve these incredible tensions that seem to be so commonplace in society and in our own lives, and to discover that God has a remedy. And that's through the forgiveness that we experience in Jesus and how we learn to give that forgiveness to other people, even as we have been forgiven. John, thank you for being with us today on the program. And I look forward to next week already. Thank you, Mike. My pleasure, really is. Folks, stay with us. I'm gonna be right back in just a moment. 
Will you donate two hours of your time? Crossroads Prayer Center is seeking people with a heart willing to join in the amazing work God is doing through prayer. Providing over 1,300 prayer interactions daily, Crossroads Prayer Partners speak biblical truth and words of life over people's needs. Join in God's transforming work through prayer and enrich your faith. Learn more at crossroads.ca slash prayer volunteer. Remember the story of a father who was walking in deep snow in the middle of the winter and his young son was following behind. He said, look, dad, I am walking in your footprints. And as I began to ponder that story and I've thought about it off and on over the years, more often than not, success in life depends on the model that we are following. On different shows, I've shared with you my lack of love for puzzles. Matter of fact, if it's left to uh, 10 or 12 pieces, then I'm kind of okay working with uh, at the five-year-old level. But don't give me the 500-piece puzzle or, or the 1,000-piece. But I know this, if I'm going to have any success putting a puzzle together, I need a picture. I need a diagram to follow. That's just the way my brain works. But in life, one of the things that sets apart God's people are the models that they choose to follow. And I'm suggesting that we need to follow more than anyone else, the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes our model. But also in the scriptures, we find pictures of individuals who are in tune with God and we're told, use them as a model. Paul would write of uh, a man named Epaphroditus. That's a mouthful. Never call your child Epaphroditus, but it's a great name anyways because of who it was. He says that he became a model because he loved the people. And uh, he talks so passionately about how Epaphroditus actually extended himself almost to the point of giving up his own life for the people that he was caring for. Those are great models. Those are great examples. I think of a man named Fred Mutter, who has long since gone in the presence of God, but he modeled to me what unconditional love looked like in a marriage as he cared for his wife, who was an invalid for many, many years. I think of another man who did the same. And then I know of many other women who have cared for their husbands. And I see in that models, healthy models. The Bible talks about, in verses 6 to 8 of Colossians, about models. Let me read it to you. And Paul talks about hearing the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world. It is bearing fruit and increasing as it does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth just as you learned it from Epaphroditus, um, a beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. What a powerful statement about this man. Have you ever thought about who you model, maybe consciously or unconsciously? A lot of times we model uh, our favorite singer. Sometimes it's a movie star. We think, oh, if we could only have what they have, we begin to emulate their stuff. Maybe it's a sports person and you're a younger person. You just think of, oh, I could just be like him. Then I would have arrived. We need to be careful about the people we choose as our models to make sure that they themselves are following after Christ because they will lead us aside. Otherwise, it'll be a train wreck. It'll be going off the tracks of life. And as we journey through this passage in Colossians, it also tells us that our love in the Spirit becomes a marker that we are the people of God. That's another marker. That's what it says about Epaphras. He said, he told us of your love in the Spirit. Something powerful is said to the community around us when they see us loving and caring for people. As a pastor, I've often cringed at the thought when someone has said, what would happen if your church was removed from the community? Would anybody even remember that you were there? And I believe the way that people remember that we have been there 
is when we model the love of Christ, when we care for people, when we extend to the, the homeless, the, uh, the parentless children, we extend to them help, love. When we provide programs, we rehabilitate people, we take them in. Because the ministry of Jesus is to those that are brokenhearted, to those that are captives. And there's something that happens, and it was happening with the, the church at Colossae, that the world was looking on, and they knew that they were different because they were emulating the love of Christ. And when that happens in your life and mine, the world will take notice. You know, we read uh, that our love in the Spirit is a sign that we are living the crucified life. So I want to encourage you today, because in our own strength, we can't be those kind of people, but to say, God, will you live through me? Will you love through me? Will you not just be my savior, but would you be my leader and my Lord? To say anytime, any place, anywhere, I'm yours, I'm available. Hear what God is whispering to you today. Hi, I'm Ryan Walter, and playing in the NHL, I was so fortunate to win a Stanley Cup ring. So thankful with the Montreal Canadiens in 1986. Now, Jenny and I, we had the ring in our home and we lost the ring. Can you believe losing a Stanley Cup ring? Couldn't find it. We looked everywhere. We were scouring, finally found it in the drawer of our, our daughter, Christy. <laughs> she was young, she took the ring. It must've been sparkly and, and she put it in her drawer. Uh, here's what I'd like to leave you with. So in Mark 10, it says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you'll find it. We were seeking, uh, knock and the door will be opened. Three great ideas in our Christian walk. Ask, seek and knock. If you're a little bit like me, I don't want to think that I'm bent on revenge, but I do know what it's like when somebody does wrong to me. And in those moments, I'm somewhat embarrassed by the feelings that I have and saying, oh, wow, what, is that really within me? And then I'm thinking, well, I deserve to feel that way. And, and they are in the wrong. There is a place for us to hold people accountable. No doubt about it. We need to call wrong, wrong, and not pretend that everything is okay. Maybe you're listening today and you've caused incredible pain in people's lives. I want to encourage you to own that, to go to those people and say, I have caused you pain and I am asking you to forgive me. It's not beyond the realm of the possibility for you to rectify the situation that perhaps you have contributed negatively to. But the good news is this, we have a savior and his name is Jesus. And he's died on the cross to forgive you and me of our sins so that God does not have to take revenge on us. He actually took it out on Jesus when he gave his life for you and me. And I want to invite you to follow the one who is the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, and the God of love, the Lord Jesus. Why don't you surrender your life to him today and ask him to be a part of your journey? Don't do it alone. Experience his forgiveness and call us at any time. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for watching The Perspective.